Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Hey there, Jim. Hey, John. Boy, we are sprinting to the end of this book and therefore the first season of this podcast, huh? We we are indeed. We're episode 122. We're about to hear chapter 21, which is, uh, if I believe I'm using the term correctly, the penultimate chapter of the ambitious term. Yeah, Yeah. that's the correct term. Good. Yes. So we're, it's kind of cliffhangery right now for anyone who listened in last time, uh, are Eli and Megan going to make it out of the cave alive? My money says yes, because there's (laughs) seven books after this one, but you never know. We could lose Megan. It's uh, it's, you keep reading folks. We don't know how this, we know Eli probably makes it, but uh, Megan could be killed. We don't oh, know. Oh, that's terrible. I'm sorry. That's I'm terrible. just trying to, I'm hiding, I'm heightening the, uh, you know, the thing. Yes. So uh, in this episode and in our last episode, we've been talking to magicians who were lucky enough to know Di Vernon, AKA the professor. Oof, boy, wouldn't that be something to have spent time in his company, not just in his company, but as one of his confidants. Yes. Uh, last time we talked to uh, John Carney, who uh, got to know him at the Magic Castle and learned a lot from him. Di Vernon is referenced, I think, in virtually every one of the Eli Marks books. I could be wrong on that. If there's someone out there who has the time and the energy to do that kind of search, I'd love to hear it. Uh, even one of his most famous tricks, which is called The Trick That Cannot Be Explained, turns up in book number eight, The Self-Working Trick. Like I said, last time we talked to John Carney, this time, we're very lucky to be able to spend some time with Steve Spill. Now, Steve yeah. literally grew up in the Magic Castle as a teenager. He used to skip school, go hang out with Vernon after the professor had finished his piano lesson at the castle. Yeah, Steve, uh, one of the luckiest people on the planet uh, for that reason and many others. Just a terrific guy. We were lucky to talk to him in the first place. He, he has a terrific career in magic. Starts there by hanging out with the professor, but he goes on to own and operate magic. Uh, Magicopolis for many, many years, starting in 1998. And um, we caught up with him. Get this, folks, in the 50th state in the Union, Hawaii. Not bad, huh? Not bad at all. In fact, uh, we didn't waste any time. We jumped right into our main topic. How did you first meet Di Vernon? I met him in 1965. I was 10 years old. Uh, My dad was the uh, manager of the Magic Castle. I knew him uh, from then, 65, till he passed away in uh, uh, 92 when he was 98 years old. And um, he taught me the basic card moves as I was growing up. So from him, I learned how to force a card and do the pass and the double lift and, uh, and so on. I was, uh, he gave me the nickname Spill. My born name is Spillman. He dropped the man and, and used Spill because he said I was a boy magician. So, you know, that's, uh, and the nickname stuck and eventually became my legal name. He was really the first person, as I became older and a teenager and so on, uh, the Magic Castle became very uh, popular and he was smothered at night with uh, magicians and, you know, seeking information and counsel. And he was a great raconteur, so they were listening to his stories. But in the daytime, he was completely available. Uh, I was in high school. I used to regularly uh, ditch high school and hitchhike from where I lived in Woodland Hills to uh, Hollywood and hang out with the professor one-on-one in the uh, daytime. He was still driving at that time too. He had an old MG and he was kind of, you know, for the how meticulous he uh, was with sleight of hand and so on, he was a, kind of a wild man at the wheel uh, driving in this two-seat white MG with the uh, walnut gearship knob. And uh, I mean, we never got in an accident and he didn't jump any curbs or anything, but he definitely wouldn't be slowing down before a turn or, you know, it was, it was pretty crazy times. He, I, how I got onto this is that he used to once a week have a, a piano lesson with Ray Grismer, who was also a magician and a piano player. They would use the piano at the Magic Castle. And so the first couple of times I saw him in the day, I had uh, heard about this and I stuck in through the kitchen and was there. And after the piano lesson, we hung out and, and then I became a regular daytime visitor. It was like sort of my secret thing to meet with him then instead of uh, trying to be around him in the evening when he's had a lot of activity going on. Also, when I was a teenager, I had a really turning point that, that, that kind of valley where he sort of 
Vernon validated me as a, a magician and a lifelong friend and so on. In a routine that I showed him, I had uh, fooled him for a nanosecond by uh, in the course of this routine vanishing a sponge ball with a thumb tip, which at that time either had never been done or uh, if it had been, no one was familiar with it. And that at that point he had told me, and I think I was about 17 then, that um, uh, if I stuck with magic, you know, I could make a mark in this, in this craft. I, I should mention that um, he uh, was really in the 20s in a, in a backroom underground sort of way, recognized as the very top sleight of hand artist. He traveled the country seeking out card cheats and, and, his, and, and gaining their confidence and learning secret moves from them. And it was on the idea, the philosophy that uh, magicians uh, performing, an audience might be polite and not tell you if they see something really sneaky, but you know, in a card game where there's money at stake, I mean, you could be injured or hurt or killed or et cetera. And so he felt like a lot of those uh, sleights of hand, if you will, were superior to ones used at that time by magicians. And he applied those to magic tricks. The, when he kind of moved from that underground acknowledgement to uh, being a known expert was when he fooled Houdini, which he fooled him a number of times uh, in a row uh, with the uh, ambitious card trick, which if you don't know, a, a card is placed in the center of the deck and it keeps rising to the top. Aside from the fact that he uh, uh, did that, the slight, the basic slight for that rather well, he also incorporated uh, what's known as a double face card, which it made it elaborate, made the trick uh, even more deceptive. And going with the same sort of thing like the uh, experts uh, or being known as a sleight of hand expert, he, he kind of aggregated not just from gamblers, but the best of all of the magicians of his era and, and refined those things and, and made, uh, made uh, sort of classic routines that are even done today for the cups and balls and the rings or the ambitious card triumphs where you shuffle the cards uh, face up and face down and they straighten out. And most of his advice and influence uh, on the, the craft has uh, become gospel. You know, a lot of his original thoughts and philosophies are just, they're taken for granted. They don't even probably go credit back to him, a lot of them, but they, they, they did originate with him. He's really in a class by himself uh, today. Uh, not only that his routines are still done and so on, but a lot of the phrases are things that were, he repeated over and over, like the effect is more important than the method or a good trick can be described in one sentence or a few words and, and a classic one don't make unimportant things important a lot of times the procedure on the way there's some discrepancy in a trick and some performers might get nervous when they get to that point and it a little makes that point more imp more important than it should be um, did he also say confusion is not magic yes he did as yeah. a matter of he once said that personally to me for some trick I made up, as a matter of fact, yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, it, what was great is uh, trying to live up and, and win his uh, approval. You know, it, there were many, many things that I showed him that, well, oh, that's not good. You know, you can't do that. Isn't that's kind of how he sounded, by the way. So. Why, why do you think he is so revered by uh, other magicians? You talked about him being just uh, swarmed and inundated at night with people wanting a moment of his time or advice from him. What, what is it about him that has elevated him to this sort of, as you mentioned, gospel status? Well, several things. One, he was a great raconteur. raconteur. He, he told great stories about uh, all kinds of characters from the past uh, in a variety of, from actors and New York society people and so on. He was an expert at giving advice. Uh, you could show him something and he would tell you where the weak points are, or how to make it better. And uh, many of the routines that he developed are still in use today. Ones like that uh, he developed 50 years ago, 70 years ago. I was also, so I was trying to think, I know that uh, I was asked, you know, what if I had a favorite story about Vernon? You know, I'm not sure this is a favorite, but it's something really kind of an idiosyncrasy that I, uh, at the time, liked or learned to love about him. 
the reason I'm mentioning it now is it kind of goes in hand in hand at how I remember him. He had the ability to um, fall asleep at any time in a crowded room, a dinner party, watching a magic show at a convention. Now we would call it narcolepsy. This wasn't diagnosed as that in the past. And I first witnessed this at um, Joe Berg's magic shop, which was an upstairs in an office uh, magic store in Hollywood. It wasn't a store, for, uh, you know, street level store. So it was something that uh, you had to know about it. And I was there with Vernon one afternoon and we were having a normal conversation and he just nodded his head down and started to snore. And uh, the guy working at the magic shop, normally Joe Berg was there himself, but sometimes he would have to take his wife to the doctor or something. And his son, Ronnie Berg would take over. And if Ronnie wasn't available, available Mike Skinner, who was uh, also a student of Vernon and a great sleight of hand artist with a huge repertoire uh, would work there. And he was there that day. And you know, Vernon starts to nod off. And Mike says to me, you know how you wake him up? If you whisper diagonal palm shift, the professor will instantly wake up. So he's, you know, snoring and his head is down. And I say, diagonal palm shift. And he instantly wakes up and says, well, the diagonal palm shift, if you uh, combine it with the uh, Leipzig uh, bottom palm and do a back palm, you can ha have a hard card concealed and show both card hands empty while smoking a cigar. And, you know, and it was a very elaborate procedure and uh, something that he had sort of combined some ideas from different people. And it was something that was unique to him. I have a fond memory of that. And, and many times that was about 12 when that happened. And many times since, I would see him nod off and demonstrate that for other people. It was really funny. You know, at that time, there were not really comedy performers in magic. Uh, what was thought of as a comedy magic was Carl Ballantyne, who was a great guy, knew him a little bit. He even came to my uh, Magicopolis show once, where all the tricks go wrong. And I kind of wanted to be trying to be funny, but, you know, I wanted the tricks to go right. And I think that's from growing up, meeting a lot of Di Vernon and Charlie Miller and, and so on, these guys that uh, weren't particularly funny. So I had that as kind of my foundation. It wasn't until I met um, Al Flosso one year, came from New York to be on the It's Magic Show, which was an annual magic show produced by uh, Milt Larson at the uh, Wilshire Bell Theater. And when they did the tech check, I was the boy that assisted him for the miser's dream. And so it started to be the really revelation. I became friendly with Flosso and during the course of the week hung out with him uh, backstage with most of the shows. And he was the first real example that I had uh, that I took to heart of combining comedy and magic. And the, the magic was actual magic, not tricks that didn't work. I don't know if you noticed, but you have two magic geeks here with our mouths agape that you got to work with Al Flosso. Yeah, Al Flosso, oh, Charlie right. Miller, Di Vernon, my goodness, uh, Kuda Bucks and uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Francis Carlisle. I mean, these are incredible names if you are interested in magic and, and they were you hung out and spent time and learned from them. Well, you know, at that time, magic was kind of at a low ebb. These uh, men were not really working professionally too much. You know, Goshman kind of worked a little bit, you know, or more than the other guys, but mostly they were hanging out. And in those uh, particularly early days of the Magic Castle, uh, this is before they had the, when I'm talking about really early, before they had the restaurant or the, all the other showrooms, they just had the piano and the close-up room and the bar. There were many days that uh, there was no one there except those guys. And when it started to become more of a real business and they made a hard, you had to be 21 to come to the club, uh, Sunday nights, if you were under 21, you could come. That was kind of, uh, you know, I had them all to myself sort of program. I was maybe 10 to 12 or 13 years old. And then as a teenager and an adult, the castle became more popular and they added the restaurant and the showrooms and so on. Were it not for the fact that my dad was the manager, which I can give you a little bit of background on that. My dad was in radio and then started in early television. I'm um, originally from San Francisco and my family moved to Los Angeles to be more involved in early television. They had recently done the uh, 
coast to coast hookup and the networks were all starting and so on. And my dad, you know, knocked on a lot of doors and did a lot of interviews and so on. And he met Bill Larson when the Magic Castle was sort of an idea before they'd actually, you know, built the club and opened it. And uh, anyway, so he, he met, uh, Bill Larson worked at CBS at that time. I think he was a producer or something. And uh, uh, magic was a, a hobby with my dad. My grandfather had, uh, was a tailor in San Francisco and had sewn some secret pockets in a magician's tuxedo. And that magician taught my grandfather a few tricks, which he taught to my dad. And that's where his interest in magic came uh, from. And that's how it was kind of passed on to me. I, I learned uh, my first few tricks when I was, you know, five years old. So it's in your blood. Now, do you think if you hadn't have had that time, individual time with these guys, do you think you might not have gone into entertainment? Or do you think that was predestined? You just got really lucky with your teachers. You know, I have no idea. But at, at some point, it became a cosmic mandate. You know, I sort of had to do it. And uh you know, sometimes you always hear of the uh, Stockholm, you know, syndrome where people are uh, <laughs> kidnapped and then uh, they fall in love with their captor. That's a little bit, well, I've been a slave to magic for, you know, a long time, so. That's great. <laughs> so, it's, uh, how do you think Di Vernon will be remembered? I think Di Vernon is a in a class by himself and will always be held up as the highest bar of sleight of hand in terms of art and skill and genius. I, I think that's a mantle that uh, will always, he'll be always ascend to, you know? You know, Jim, our good friend, Suzanne the Magician, actually performed in front of the professor. Talk about nerve wracking, huh? Yeah, and she said that when she was done and people were filing out of the room, he looked over at her and gave her a smile and a thumbs up. Oof, I would take that. Yes, yes. <laughs> I would take that completely. What a great uh, interview with Steve there. How'd you like to How'd you like to just, uh, you know, sit in the passenger seat while Di Vernon drove you around? Well, I'm, I think it's amazing that they both survived. And uh, <laughs> I also just love the narcolepsy story. The whole idea of just uh, get up next to him and whisper diagonal palm shift and he'll suddenly wake up and, and dive into it. <laughs> it's so much fun to run into people and be able to talk to people who have, you know, talked to the greats in this business. We're, we're very, very lucky to be able to do that on this show. Yeah, we absolutely are. I'm luckier than you. you. You've you included me out of the goodness of your heart. But let it be known from this point forward, if I'm ever in Hawaii, I'm not going to make time to talk to you. I think just about every, I think 99% of the people listening would agree with you on that. Uh, for those of you who check the show notes, and I think there are some of you who do, we have some great clips of Steve performing. You can see his hair go from... Uh, very dark to very gray uh, in the clips, not just in one clip, but over a series of clips. It didn't happen all Is that at a once. magic trick or? No, it's just, uh, he's well-documented uh, his career. Ah, so you can see, all, see, what you're saying. see the many funny things he did. And we also have some clips of Di Vernon in action. And they're worth looking at if for no other reason than to listen to Di Vernon actually speak, because I think we've had a number of people do their impression of Di Vernon uh, over the last season and to hear him actually talking you go oh he does he, he actually sounds like that that's amazing there's a little uh, there's a little bit of Di Vernon in the voice I use for Uncle Harry just a little just a shade of Di really Vernon in there yeah oh. just a little bit well, I'll have to listen for that next time I listen to one of those great Eli Marks books I, I'd listen to all of them if I were you <laughs> oh I have so many times <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us, Jim. All right. Speaking of uh, the Eli Marks books, the reason we're here is to get us into chapter 21. If you remember in chapter 20, uh, Eli and Megan were trapped in the cave. They were using flash paper to light their way. They were using the helium oxygen mixture and they were encountering bats. And that takes us into chapter 21. This one, this is the one where Megan dies. We'll see. The Ambitious Card, an Eli Marks Mystery, Chapter 21. The previous hour or so had felt like a ping pong match between good and bad news, and when we entered the next chamber, bad news continued its winning streak. 
The good news, which was meager at best, was that the moment we made it out of what I had come to think of as the Bat Corridor, we were hit with actual fresh air and could see the night sky ahead of us. We breathed in the crisp, cold breeze, and, for a moment at least, I didn't mind being covered in bat pee, or I minded a little bit less. The first wave of bad news was the realization that the only thing that separated us from our well-earned freedom was a two-foot-by-two-foot two metal grate, a thick, barred grid with square holes large enough for a bat to crawl through. We headed immediately toward this barrier, and I grasped its bars tightly, giving them a hard shake. The grate was very solid and didn't budge. If that wasn't bad enough, the next piece of bad news became vividly apparent as we looked through the grate. The clouds had lifted, and it was a crisp, clear night. It appeared to be just after sunset, and we could see the tops of the trees and, in the distance, the river and the lights of downtown St. Paul. Uh-oh, I said quietly. What? Megan asked, turning to me. What is it? We found the way out. What's the problem? Her voice had almost entirely returned to its normal pitch. We're near the peak of one of the bluffs. I can see the tops of the trees were pretty high up. Is that bad? Yes, but that's our second problem. Our first problem is this grate. It's really solid. I stood back, my eyes still adjusting to the dim light, and examined how the grate was attached to the rock wall. Must be fastened on the outside, I said, as I stepped closer and tried to see what was holding the grate in place. Megan stepped next to me to see. Just at that moment, a tardy bat flew between the two of us, brushing the side of my face as it maneuvered through one of the larger holes in the grate. Megan jumped back and yelped. Son of a bitch, she said, immediately checking her hair for unwelcome visitors. Boy, there's something about bats that really brings out the sailor in you, I commented, and then returned to the fruitless task of shaking the sturdy, heavy grate. I was ready to give up, but just for the hell of it, I gave it one more obligatory yank, and then I felt it give, just a little. I rattled the grate again. What did that TV guy say before Gray's performance in the cave? Something about not touching the walls because of how soft they were? Megan shook her head. I wasn't there, she said. But my grandfather used to lecture us about that all the time, about how the cave walls were made of sandstone and how easy it was to dig into them. Didn't matter how much he said it, though, we still did it. So even though this is a really solid piece of metal, I said as I examined the grate more closely, it's attached to what is essentially soft rock? Soft rock? Like Fleetwood Mac, Megan asked, trying to hide the traces of a smirk. I see someone's sense of humor is creeping back in, I said. So if the rock that's holding this is soft, it really doesn't matter how sturdy the actual grate is. I stepped back and then rushed at the grate, hitting it with the full force of my shoulder and all the weight behind it. I was unable to gauge the impact I'd made on the grate as the impact on my shoulder was so intense pain-wise that for a second I felt like I was going to pass out. This made me so mad that I stood back from the grate and lifted my right leg as high as I could and kicked with the full force of my body. I did that twice more with less force each time before falling backward onto the dirt. I tried to keep my whimpering to a minimum. The grate hung exactly where it had for years and glared back at me with a silent superiority that I found annoying. I'll give it a try, Megan said, taking a position in front of the metal grid. Don't bother, I said from my place on the ground. They found the one spot in all the caves where the rock isn't soft. She ignored me and prepared to make her own Bruce Lee-style karate kick, balancing on her right leg and arching her left leg directly at the grate. She gave her best karate yell and kicked firmly at the grid. Her foot bounced off the metal like a tennis ball off the side of a garage, and she tumbled backwards to the ground, landing neatly on top of me. Son of a bitch, she grumbled as she rolled off of me, placing her elbow squarely into my kidneys in the process. She saw a fist-sized rock on the dusty ground where she had landed and grabbed it, throwing it with fury at the barred metal. 
The rock hit cleanly at the center of the grate, making a resonant clang before falling back to the ground. We turned away, but the sound of metal grinding on rock drew our attention back to the opening. A second later, the grate slipped effortlessly away from the wall and tumbled out of sight down into the woods below. The only unsettling part of the temporary victory was how long it took for us to hear the sound of it hitting the ground. It took a lot longer than I might have liked. I pulled myself painfully to my feet and stepped forward to examine the obstacle-free opening. Behind me I could hear Megan as she gave a small cheer of joy. Now what? Megan asked as she joined me. She was grinning ear to ear. Now we transform ourselves into mountain goats and climb down, I said, as I began to pull myself through the hole. The bluffs that line the riverfront across from downtown St. Paul are admittedly not exactly Mount Everest. Even if there had been snow on the ground, there was no chance of an avalanche, and we were within sight of civilization, so there wouldn't be any Andes-style snacking to worry about. Be that as it may, it looked to be a long way down. Given the distance between us and the footpath below, I seriously wondered how a lone Parks Department worker had made it up here to install the grate, poorly or otherwise. I crawled through the hole and stood precariously on a small ledge beneath it. I looked up the bluff and gauged that climbing higher wasn't a practical option. It looked like quite a hike, a steep one at that, and I had no idea where it would ultimately leave us. Going down made more sense because I could see the road below and knew that it would take us to my car and, more importantly, to my phone. Let me go first, I said to Megan as I helped her through the hole. I think I can see the safest way down. I stepped back to make room for her on the small ledge and felt the ground give way as my feet came out from beneath me. Then I felt a bush, followed by the branches of a small tree, some shrubs, followed by some stones, both large and small, another tree, then a series of shrubs, this time of the prickly variety, as I slid down the face of the hill. It was not unlike riding down one of those huge slides at the state fair or carnival, except that the sliding surface was far from smooth and there was nothing between me and the hill but my pants. Somewhere between seven and ten seconds later, I was lying in a heap at the bottom of the bluff with bits of my pants and some of my skin spread out on the hill above me. It was clear that I had discovered the fastest, albeit not the least painful, way down. I heard Megan above me, swearing as she struggled to make her way down the hill without following the express route I had just taken. As I listened to her slow, profane progress, I did a quick systems check, wiggling first my fingers and then my toes. After that proved moderately successful, I tried moving my upper limbs and then the lower ones. I felt pain through every inch of my body, but nothing sharp and nothing specific, leading me to believe that while much of me was badly bruised, none of me was actually broken. By the time Megan reached my side, I was able to sit up, although the flashbulbs going off in my head made me wish I hadn't. I touched a sore spot on my forehead, and my hand came back red, so apparently I was bleeding in at least one area. What took you so long? I asked, then spit some dirt out of my mouth. Are you okay? That looked really painful. Not a problem. Luckily, my body broke the fall. Help me up. I began the deliberate process of putting my feet under me, and with Megan's assistance, I was able to stand shakily. I looked back up at the dark opening into the cave and shook my head at how far away it appeared. Then I turned my gaze toward the road. This path should lead us to Water Street, I said. From there we can walk or hitch back to the parking lot. I leaned on Megan and we started toward the road. The pain, which was equally dispersed throughout my body, started to fade the more I moved. And by the time we reached the road, I was able to walk on my own with only the trace of a limp. You know what we're learning? Megan asked several minutes later as we made our way along the side of Water Street. Don't marry a psycho. Don't let him lock you in a cave. 
don't scare a flock of bats in a small space. She cut me off, sensing correctly that I was just getting warmed up. No, we're learning that no one wants to pick up hitchhikers who are dirty, battered, bloodied, and smelling of bat pee. Well, to be fair, they probably wouldn't know that we smell of bat pee until we got into their car. I'm not so sure, she said. Some people have a sixth sense about bat pee, and many of them seem to be driving down Water Street tonight. On some level, she was correct. Consequently, what would have been a five-minute trip with the help of a friendly, open-minded driver turned into a 20-minute walk back to the Wabashaw Cave's main entrance. My car was the only one in the lot. Pete must have taken Megan's with the idea of placing it back in its traditional spot behind her store. I had to admit, his plan looked good, on paper. To outsiders, it would appear that I had driven Megan to the caves and then gotten trapped inside with her. The case would be closed. He'd get all of her assets and could sell them as he wished, and no one would be any the wiser. We should get out of here, Megan said, a trace of fear in her voice, in case Pete comes back. I don't think Pete is coming back until he's certain that we've expired due to carbon monoxide poisoning, I said, as I opened the passenger door and picked my phone up off the seat. I was about to call Deirdre, when I noticed that I had received three calls, all from her. She had left the same number of voicemails. I listened to the first one. Eli, where are you? She said in the message, her voice sounding more than usually stressed. I'm at your uncle's shop. There's been an accident. Call me now. I didn't bother listening to the other messages, but started the car and then proceeded to violate several traffic laws as I made my best time yet getting back to Minneapolis. From a block away, it was clear that something was going on at Chicago Magic. An ambulance, a fire truck, and several squad cars were parked haphazardly in front of the store, their flashing lights creating psychedelic patterns on the storefronts. A crowd of onlookers were being held at bay by several uniformed officers. As we approached, a voice yelled out to me, Eli! Eli, old boy, what's going on? It was Clive standing on the edge of the crowd, holding his portable police scanner in one hand while he held a small video camera above the crowd and pointed it in the general direction of the front door of our shop. There was one call on the scanner, and since then they've been completely mum on the topic. Occasionally, one of the medics or the firemen will come out coughing, then they turn around and go back in. What the devil is going on? Clive, I haven't a clue, I said as I pushed through the crowd with Megan right behind me. I got to the front and was ducking under the police tape they'd strung around the front sidewalk when a uniformed officer yelled at me from the curb. Hey, you, stay behind the tape. It's okay, a familiar but not friendly voice bellowed. We've been waiting for him. I looked up to see homicide detective Fred Hutton standing over me. He lifted the yellow tape up high enough for Megan and me to scamper through, then waved us into the store. The flashing lights were creating weird patterns on his face. I couldn't really read his expression, but I didn't like the fact that he had been borderline polite to me. That couldn't be good. Deirdre was waiting for us on the other side of the door. Deirdre, what happened? What's going on? I asked, scanning the shop. It was a small space and didn't really seem large enough to hold the number of cops, EMTs, and firemen that were currently in camp there. They were all standing at the front of the shop, making it impossible for me to see what was going on in the back. Eli, she said, putting out a hand to stop me from moving forward. There's been an accident. That's why I was calling you. Your uncle... I didn't wait for her to finish, but pushed past her through the wall of civil servants till I got to the back of the shop. The back counter was blocking my view, but I could see a pair of legs sprawled on the floor at the base of the steep steps that led to our apartments. Harry, I called out. I moved toward the body, but a hand reached out and stopped me. I wouldn't go back there if I were you, a voice said. I turned and was completely surprised and thrilled to see Harry seated on a stool by the counter. One of the EMTs was bandaging Harry's hand, but otherwise he looked unharmed. Harry, you're okay? I'm fine. What happened to you? I'll tell you about it later. Who's that back there on the floor? It's that terrible magic student of yours, he said, 
and then gestured next to me, that young lady's husband. Ex-husband, Megan said. She had made her way through the crowd and was standing by my side. Or at least he will be as soon as I get the papers signed. I'm afraid he won't be signing papers any time soon, Harry said with a sad shake of his head. Why, is he... I wasn't sure the best way to ask the question with Megan standing next to me. Is the little prick dead? Megan said, cutting me off. No, Harry replied quickly. Quite the contrary. The little prick is very much alive, but he's taken a bit of a spill, and I suspect that he'll be in the hospital for the foreseeable future. So if he's alive and needs to go to the hospital, why is he still lying back there? Harry shrugged. They got a neck brace on him and put him on one of those backboards to prevent any further spinal injury. But I think they're taking a short break. He glanced over at the EMTs, who were in the front of the shop, taking turns with an oxygen mask. There's the problem of the smell. He looked us over, head to toe. You probably didn't notice it yourselves, given your current olfactory situation. He sniffed the air around us. Bat guano, am I right? On the nose, I said. So what happened? Well, he came in here about an hour ago, pretending to want to buy a cups and balls set. Of course, I refused to sell it to him, as he hasn't begun to master the cut and restored rope trick we sold him two weeks ago. So then he pulled a gun on me, Harry recounted indignantly. I told him flat out that wasn't going to change my mind, but he started yammering about how he needed to tie up the loose ends. Turns out he's the fellow that's been killing all the psychics. He said he had it all worked out, that the police would think you did it, but that he knew I was the only one who would ever put all the pieces together, so I had to be, in his words, taken care of. You always did scare the hell out of him, I said. Well, be that as it may, he kept pointing the gun at me and told me to head upstairs. So I did as I was told, when we got to the top in my kitchen, I started coughing and doubled over. Were you okay? Megan asked. I was fine, my dear, Harry said. I just needed him to step a bit closer to me, and when he did, I fired at him right in the face. With a gun? Megan asked, her eyes wide. No, no, nothing like that, Harry said reassuringly. On my way upstairs... I palmed one of those horrible cans of fart spray that Eli has had sitting around on the back counter for the last two weeks. Good thing I never got around to restocking those shelves, I said. Harry clucked his tongue. Perhaps, perhaps. He turned his attention back to Megan. I blasted him right in the face with the putrid stuff. Then I pulled the rug out from under him. What did you do? I asked. I just told you. I pulled the rug out from under him. You know that little braided rug that your Aunt Alice had at the top of the stairs? After I blasted him in the face, I reached down and pulled it out from under him. Backwards he went, ass over tea kettle, landing with a thud at the bottom of the stairs. Megan and I exchanged looks, marveling at Harry's resourcefulness. Aunt Alice always said someone was going to break their neck on those stairs someday. And she was right, Harry agreed. As always, the old girl was right. In spite of the smell, it was ultimately decided that Pete should be moved to a hospital, given that he probably had a broken back and certainly had broken one leg, one arm, and several ribs. The EMTs lifted him on the backboard to a stretcher, and the cops and firemen cleared a path so they could roll him out of the store. Pete was conscious, although clearly in pain, and the double-take that he gave when they wheeled him past Megan and me must have been painful indeed. At least I hope it was. How the hell did you get out of the cave? He croaked in a thin, raspy voice. I shook my head at him and wagged a finger in the air. A professional magician never reveals his methods, I said with a smile. It felt really, really good to have the last word. They continued to roll him out. He tried to look back at us, but between the neck brace and the intense pain, it wasn't going to happen. After he was gone, the smell lingered on. How are you doing? I asked Megan as I put a hand on her shoulder. I'm okay, she said. 
I just wish Harry hadn't pushed him down the stairs. I know, it looks like it was very painful. She shook her head. No, she said. I wish I'd been the one to push him. And just between you and me, Eli, she added more confidently, if all those cops hadn't been swarming around here, I would have dragged the little bastard to the top of those damn stairs and shoved him down again. I nodded in agreement. I think I understand, I said, and I'll make a mental note never to get on your bad side. I looked up to see Deirdre waving me over from across the room. She and homicide detective Fred Hutton had been conferring in a whispered conversation. You smell almost as bad as our perp, Deirdre said as I approached the pair. What did you get into? It's really more what I got out of, I said. Pete's final victim was going to be his wife, Megan. She's a psychic who works in crystals, so he locked us in a cave with no oxygen with the idea that it would look like I was the killer and I had somehow screwed up. I would have bought that premise, homicide detective Fred Hutton said dryly. He was counting on that, and I guess he figured that somehow Harry would have been able to put all the pieces together, so he had to remove him from the equation. I looked back toward the stairs that Pete had intended to push Harry down before inadvertently making the trip himself. It would either look like an accident, or maybe you guys might have figured I did it and that I just tried to make it look like an accident. Either way, Pete would be free and clear and could go on his merry, murderous way. Deirdre nodded. That fits with the conversation we had with Harry and the brief conversation we had with your girlfriend's husband before the EMTs took him out. We would have questioned him further, but the smell precluded that. You actually sell that product? Homicide Detective Fred Hutton asked. More of them than I'd like to admit, I said. After experiencing the results, I would argue that a permit should be required for purchase, he said. Anyway, Deirdre said, pointedly turning the conversation away from the impending fart spray legislation, Fred and I have discussed it, Eli, and we're both confident that you're no longer a suspect in this case. We have a few loose threads to tie up, but the DA will indict your hospital-bound friend on three charges of murder in the first degree, along with four counts of attempted murder, plus assault charges for his attack on you and Mr. Boone if you wish to pursue those charges. I would love to pursue those charges, I said. I'd like Pete to be locked up for a good long time. I can pretty much assure that, Deirdre replied. And knowing her as I did, it was as good as done. I watched as she turned and continued to confer closely with her husband, and I determined at that moment to no longer call him Mediocre Fred, at least for the time being. Homicide Detective Fred Hutton and Assistant D.A. Deirdre Sutton Hutton left a short while later, and soon after their departure, the rest of our visitors made their own exits. In a matter of a few minutes, the shop went from being completely packed to just the three of us, me, Megan, and Harry. I walked Megan to the door while Harry pretended to be busy restocking the fart spray. When we got to the door, Megan turned and looked up at me. So, what did you think of our second date, she asked. In a word, memorable. So what's next for the two of us? I'm headed home to take a long, long bubble bath, she said. Well, that sounds very inviting, I said. That's why I'm inviting you, she said, flashing a wicked little smile. Unless you have other plans, she added. No, that sounds wonderful, just wonderful. The thing is... I said, and then cut myself off, picking my words carefully. This may sound weird, but before I come over to take a bath, I'd like to take a long, hot shower and maybe burn my clothes. No, wait, not maybe, definitely, definitely burn my clothes. I hear you, she said. Meet me at my place in an hour. She stood on her tiptoes and gave me a quick kiss on the lips, which turned out not to be so quick after all. And then she left. I locked the door and turned to see Harry, who was still pretending to be occupied with restocking the gag shelf. You want something done right around here, you have to do it yourself, he grumbled as he put the last product in place. You got a date? Looks like it, I said as we headed toward the back stairs. Did you eat yet? No, he said. Haven't gotten around to that. Been a busy night. 
That it was. We stopped at the base of the stairs. Why don't you throw some leftovers in the oven and I'll sit with you after I take a shower? Buster, that would be nice. Oh, will you look at that? He bent down and picked up three dimes that were lying at the base of the steps. He held them up for me proudly. Three more dimes from your aunt, he said, smiling widely. They probably came out of Pete's pocket when he fell, I offered. That's plausible, he said as he started up the stairs. I considered for a moment, then spoke again. Harry, you know those dimes aren't really from Aunt Alice, don't you? He turned and looked down on me, his face beaming. Buster, every time I find a dime, I'm reminded of how much Alice loved me. When you look at it that way, why in the world would I care where they came from? He turned and continued his slow climb up the stairs. A moment later, I followed him. All right, that's chapter 21. We are pretty much uh, wrapping it up here, folks. Boy, aren't we, though? The, uh, it's funny because the, the last bit in that chapter is uh, Harry and Eli walking up the stairs, and those stairs uh, will turn up again uh, as a plot point sort of in the bullet catch, and they're part of one of the short stories in the eighth book, The Self-Working Trick, and they are inspired by some stairs that my my dear friend Jill Wabritsky Black's grandmother had, which she started to throw her, her grandchildren down those stairs if they didn't. <laughs> Uh, if they didn't obey. And I've always uh, liked the idea of those very, very steep stairs. Anyway, on our yeah. next episode, which will be episode 123. Thank God you can do the math on this. because And that is so the, long. speaking of penultimate, that is the penultimate episode of the season. We're going to talk uh, about people who came to magic later in life, which I suppose would include me, although I'm not a magician. Yeah, yeah. well, that's what I was going to say, is that most people come to magic, they get a magic kit of some kind between the time they're, I don't know, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. That's how you get there. But uh, not everybody gets there that way. No, you got there a different way because you had an older brother who I did was a magician. So that's still is still is. That's a rare yeah. way in. Very but good. not all magi magicians come to magic that way. And next episode, Rob Zabrecki and our friends Morgan and West are going to return to talk about how they came to magic uh, later in life. And they seem to be doing just fine with it, uh, for the record. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so if this is the penultimate chapter mm -hmm. and next ah, episode yes. is the penultimate episode. Yes. I, now, now I'm in a uh, some sort of space can time you. Now no, I'm in some no, sort you're of space-time continuum. Rip. That's because after next episode, our final episode of the season, next episode is episode 123. Final episode is 124. We have a special guest, and we're also going to have a special Eli Marks story that is separate from the Ambitious Card. So you're that's kidding. sort of a bonus episode, which includes a different story than what we've listened to so far, and also a very uh, special guest, a super guest is uh, the only hint that I'll give you on that. No, even I don't know. No, no but I'm... you will. Okay. I don't and then, uh, then we'll launch into um, season two, The Bullet Catch. Oh, boy. And, it, you know, uh, it is, that's a great book. If you, uh, and I'm enjoying the heck out of these podcasts. I don't know if you are, folks, but if you're here uh, at this late in the run of podcasts, there must be something you're enjoying. So I hope you've subscribed if you like us and even if you didn't. And uh, listen, it really helps if you leave us some sort of review on the Apple podcast that the algorithm is triggered. I'm told by your reviews and that way other listeners then can find us. And uh, we would love nothing more than to uh, entertain some more people. So if you got a minute, leave us a review and make sure you subscribe. And you don't even have to write a review. You can just rate us. You can just, there's a one through five scale. I believe five, five. is the number five is the number you'd want to hit. Yeah. Just, you don't even need to write anything down. Just say, yep. It's, these guys are a five. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a link in the show notes that'll help you get right to that Apple thing. So enough of us shilling for ourselves. Enough of us shilling for our show and our shelves. I can't even say it. Enough of I, us shilling for our show and ourselves. That's, that's it for this episode. Fast. We will see you uh, next time. Thanks for listening, everybody. Take care. 
This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham, produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Find this podcast and all the books in the Eli Marks series at elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S, mysteries.com. And thanks for listening. Thank you.